We've got these big houses full of stuff and storage units for the stuff that doesn't fit there. And just, it's too much. And so we're constantly cleaning and constantly maintaining the mundane. And then we don't have time and energy for what really matters to us. And that is just what everyone has accepted as normal. Hey everyone, and welcome to The Christy Wright Show, where faith meets personal development so you can have a bigger faith and a better life. I'm so excited because today, we are talking about three practical ways that you can love your house again. Y'all, home is such a big part of who we are and how we feel about ourselves and our life, and we're gonna talk about three simple things that you can do to love your home again. And then I get to sit down with an amazing new author, Ali Kazaza. She has a new book out called Declutter Like a Mother, and y'all, I don't know about you, but I need that in my life. But first, let's talk about these three simple things that you can do to love your home again. Now I gotta tell you, right before we started recording, I was telling our team here behind the cameras that you can't even see that actually makes this whole thing possible, how I'm living this out in real time. This is so easy for me to talk about because this is what I'm experiencing in my own life. Many of you may remember recently I talked about how in the spring, my husband and I were looking at a house. We thought we got the house. We thought this was for sure God's plan for us in this house, and it wasn't. But in the process, we got our house ready to sell and we realized how much less stuff we could live with in the process of decluttering for possibly selling it. Well, since then, I have told my husband after several months of kind of still looking for a new house and then kind of still not sure if we're gonna stay in our house, we finally decided to stay in our house. I told him, I said, I have emotionally moved back into our house. Now, that sounds silly, but when you're living with one foot out the door, well, you kind of look at your house with discontent eyes. Like, well, when we move, well, when we move, this, that, and that, oh, I can't with that thing, that creak in the stair. The simplest things drive you crazy. And also, you don't want to put money into it, right? You don't want to put money, any amount of money, into a house you're probably going to move from. And so when we emotionally move back into our house, it changed not only how we looked at it, but it changed what we wanted to do with it, which led me to this list for you today. Whether you have been looking at moving or not, whether your house is old or new, whether you love it or are kind of over it, these are three things that can help you in any home, in any life stage, in any season with your home. So the first one is really simple, it's really basic, and you're already gonna know it, but I wanna remind you, you can clean it. Yeah, now granted, you may need to send your kids away. You may need to bring in backup, get a house cleaner, get help. Do it in some creative time when they're nowhere around because you know if you try to do it when they're there, it's a lost cause. But I remember there was this one moment several years ago, and I wrote about this story actually in my devotional, Living True, 40 Days to Get Back to You. I tell the story of standing at the edge of my garage, and my garage was a mess as it usually was. There's kids' toys and old paint cans and just crap crap that got stored there when there was no one else, nowhere else to store it. It's um, by definition a two-car garage, though the only two vehicles that could park in this very small garage are motorcycles. Like, it's very, very small. I don't know how they call it two-car. But anyway, we had all these riding contraptions, and, and you couldn't even fit one car in there. And I just thought, we just need a bigger garage. See, this is why we have to move. We need a bigger garage. Like this, this garage is too small. It, this house was built in the 80s when apparently they drove small cars in the 80s. And like this, this my, we can't, I can't even fit one normal size car in here. I just, I need a new garage. We need a new house with a bigger garage. Yeah, that's what we need. That is the solution to this situation. <laughs> and y'all, in that moment, I felt the most gentle whisper say, you don't need a bigger garage, Christy. You need to clean the garage you already have. <gasps> it was right. God often is right, by the way. And so I went to work and I cleaned that garage and I got rid of the old paint cans and I organized the writing contraptions and by the end of it, it looked way better and I could fit my car in there <laughs> with room to spare. I looked at my garage differently simply because I took the time to clean it. Now, I know that when you are stressed, tired, frazzled, and especially those of you that have little kids at home, the last thing you need is one more should. 
you should clean your house, you should clean your garage, whatever. But I do want to encourage you. The amount of stuff that we have and the way that our space looks affects how we feel about ourselves, whether we like it or not, whether we realize it or not. Think about how much time you spend thinking about stuff. And I don't just mean buying stuff like, ooh, you want that new nice purse. I mean just, oh, I've gotta, I've gotta go make these returns. I've gotta pick up that. I've gotta clean off the stairs. I've gotta clean out the fridge. I've gotta get more groceries. I've gotta shuffle these hampers from this room to this room and put this stuff away. And just stuff. There's stuff everywhere, even if you're a clean person. There's so much shuffling and organizing and cleaning and purging of stuff. And if you're not careful, this stuff will steal your joy. It will steal the way that you feel about yourself. It will make you feel like a failure when you're not. And it will definitely steal any sense of balance. So the first simple thing you can do is clean it. The second thing that you can do, and this will make a big difference, is maintain it. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. So during this last six months or so where my husband and I were sort of looking at moving and then sort of not sure if we were going to, obviously we didn't do any improvements to our house because we thought we might be moving. If there was gonna be something on the inspection list, whenever, if there was a potential buyer, we would take care of it. But we're not gonna proactively spend a bunch of money on a house that we're gonna move from. So those gutters, that just had been clogged up and were kind of falling down. We just, yeah, we'd, we'd been kind of letting those go. And, and the deck, well, the deck was awesome, but the deck was so scratched up. All the stain was worn. There were spots. There was, you know, mildew in the railings. And it didn't look great. It didn't, but like when you got three kids age six and under, you're just trying to get them fed. You're not really thinking about, oh, let me stain the deck. So there were things here and there that over the last six years, my husband and I have just kind of let go. And is it fun to pay someone to stain your deck where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna spend this money to have someone restain the whole deck? No, that's not one of those things. You're like, oh wow, a new couch. It's so fun to spend that money. And y'all, I wrestled with it. Matt and I went back and forth. Should we pay someone? Should we pay someone? Should we do it? Could we do it ourselves? Yeah, see? We're handy. We just kept thinking, we'll do it. See, that's what part of these problems are. We think, oh, we'll do it ourselves. But then, again, busy three kids under six, we never do it. When would we do that? When would we make a priority to stay in a deck when we have a million other things that are more important? We wouldn't. Went back and forth. Y'all, last week, this wonderful handyman that does work at our house sometimes, stay in the deck, and it looks like a brand new deck. It is absolutely beautiful. So then what happened? I want to get a new rug. Well, that old rug was chewed up from our old dog, and it's got some milk. Let me get a new rug. Got a rug on sale. Put some throw pillows. Y'all, it's a dream out there. I was out there this morning just sitting there having some coffee, and I loved it all over again. Yes, it took a little money because we paid someone to maintain it. But what are those things around your house that you've let go just because you've lived there a long time, just because you're busy, just because you've seen them that way for like five years and you don't even notice that hole in the wall anymore or the creaky stair or the deck that needs to be stained or the gutters that need to be replaced. What is that for you? What would it look like to just make a couple phone calls and get someone to take care of that thing? I I will tell you, as I'm experiencing this in real time, maintaining your house and putting a little bit of money, a little bit of time, maybe do it yourself if you're a do-it-yourselfer and you wanna do that, but putting a little effort in maintaining your home will not only change how you feel about it and how you enjoy it, it will actually, of course, make the home last longer and look better. So the second thing you can do is maintain it. The third thing that you can do, similar to maintain it but slightly different, is improve it. What would it look like to make some actual improvements? Again, I'm living this out with you in real time, so let me give you an example. So I got Joanna Gaines' book um, last year, or the year before that. Matt got me her really beautiful coffee table book as a gift, and I was um, sitting—this was around Christmas time. I was sitting there on the couch flipping through it, and one of the very first sections, she talks about the importance of the entry into your home. Not your foyer, if you have a foyer, but the entrance that you enter— well, our foyer is is beautiful. It has a nice light fixture. It has a little buffet table with some lanterns and photos. It's lovely. Only problem is I don't enter the house there. 
where I enter is the garage I just referred to. And the garage had these old stairs that my husband had built. He did a great job on them, but because we were in a hurry whenever he built them and busy as usual, they were unfinished. I never painted them. We never finished out the edges, sanding and and closing up the gaps and all that. So while they looked fine when we first built them eight years ago, they were never finished, so then they got dirty, and then they looked gross, and there was just toys there, and there was a trash can. There was just a really gross, unattractive entrance to our home. And she said, where you enter your home matters because it affects how you feel about it. It's that first impression every time you get home. Well, I had never thought about that. And I thought, what would it look like to improve just this area, just this tiny little stair area where I come in from the garage? And so, y'all, I started dreaming of what that would look like. I sanded the stairs, and then I stained the stairs, and then I painted the wall. I even got, I even got this little um, uh, piece of art from Kirkland's that say, says, today's a good day to be happy. I'm like, just going to will that good mood in everybody on your way in and out. I got one of those hall trees and put it right there to the side instead of the trash can, move the trash can outside, put a hall tree where we could move the backpacks there instead of in the dining room taking up space. And y'all... The transformation is night and day, and it truly changes how I feel when I enter my home. Instead of stepping over trash bags and toys and coming up these dirty, gross stairs, I now have this beautiful entrance that actually affects how I feel the moment I walk in. It's a simple thing. Maybe cost a few hundred bucks for the hall tree and the stain and the print, not much in the grand scheme of things, but has a huge effect on how I enter my home. I don't know what you want to do in your house. I'm not gonna tell you what you need to do, and I'm certainly not gonna give you any more shoulds because I know that we are all weighed down by all the shoulds in the world. But I do wanna encourage you that if you're feeling discouraged in your home, if you're feeling discontent in your home, if you're feeling unhappy with your home, there are simple things that you can do that will change how you feel about it. You can clean it, you can maintain it, and you can improve it. And these three simple things will change not only how you feel about your home, they'll actually change how you feel about yourself as well. We were drawn to Christian Healthcare Ministries because we both had young families and we wanted to have more children. And we had also just started a real estate company and needed to find healthcare coverage that would meet our needs. We were attracted to CHM because of its low monthly costs and the ability to negotiate medical costs down. Established in 1981, and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, CHM is here to meet the needs of your growing family or small business. Check us out at chministries.org. We absolutely believe in it. All right, y'all, I am so excited to tell you that our brand new 2022 Goal Planner is here. You have asked for it, you have told me how much you love it in past years, and y'all, it's finally here. This is your year. I know that it can be hard to set goals and it's even harder to stick with those goals and that's why this is the tool that's going to help you do it. You've got monthly encouragement, you've got monthly calendar, weekly calendar, to-do list, and it gives you everything you need to spend your time on what matters most to you, which is what I want to help you do in your one life. It's also gonna help you grow as a person and actually stick with your goals this year. Go to christywright.com and get your goal planner today and really get it early because I'm telling you, they sell out fast. All right, y'all, I'm so excited because I get to sit down with my new friend, Ali Kazaza. Ali, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Christy. I'm super excited to chat. Okay, I want to learn from you. And this is something that I'm so excited to talk about because I know you are passionate about helping people declutter. And let's just keep it real. This is hard. It's especially hard for busy women. It's hard for moms. And and I wanna talk about this. I wanna start by just asking you, what ignited this for you to help people with this? Yeah, for sure. So this whole thing comes out of my own struggle and my own story. It was about nine years ago, and I had I have four kids now, but at the time I had three, and they were all under three years old. And so, of course, it was this really crazy time. It was really intense. It was um, just a lot of, like, struggle and figuring out the hard way, I guess. But I was, like, I was asking other women, like women that were ahead of me in life and motherhood and just kind of trying to learn and figure things out. And I just really felt like the message that I was getting over and over from books, from the internet, from these women was really just this message of kind of hopelessness. Mm. Like, 
yep, that's motherhood. Yeah. You know, don't worry, you'll get through it. And right. like, oh, you think it's hard now? Just wait till they're teens. Like, right. uh, but also, you know, carpe diem because it goes so fast. Right. Like this <laughs> messy, mixed up message of hopelessness and struggle, but also like you should be trying to soak it all up and enjoy it at the same time. Yeah. And it just didn't really sit well with me because I believe that even if things are hard, like we're supposed to enjoy and it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be good. And being depressed, being going down this drain of despair every morning, waking up with a feeling of dread in my chest before the day even started, like that's not abundant life. I don't feel like that's what I'm here for, even temporarily. Like there, I don't think we're supposed to stay there and just accept it until right. our kids are grown. And then, you know, there's also this whole message of like coffee into wine and like just barely getting through the day. Like I just, it just wasn't sitting well with me. Yeah. So I really just decided that I wasn't going to subscribe to that and I would figure out another way. And um, I set out on this journey and I was blogging about it publicly and sharing that as I went. And um, what I really came to figure out was that it's very logical, actually. The stuff that takes up our physical space, that takes up our calendars and our time and, and the space in our homes is really just robbing too much from us. It's yeah. it's too much to maintain. We've got these big houses full of stuff and storage units for the stuff that doesn't fit there. And just, it's too much. And so we're constantly cleaning and constantly maintaining the mundane. And then the things that are really like the, the meat of life are falling to the wayside. Yeah. And they're not, we don't have time and energy for what really matters to us. And that is just what everyone has accepted as normal. Yeah. So- I, yeah, I just didn't want to live that way anymore. And I, I set out to change it and it absolutely changed my life. And here we are. Yeah. Well, it, I love how you talk about this because there is such a parallel between clutter and physical clutter and even clutter on our calendars. And you and I have talked about this before. Yeah. And so I love, we're, we're just such kindred spirits in this space to set women free. And clutter, whether it's physical, mental, on your calendar, um, it gets in the way of that. And it weighs us down and it's exhausting. So I think that um, for many women, um, we we don't want that mess, right? We don't want that clutter. We don't want that chaos. And yet, to your point, it feels a little bit inevitable. And so how can we find hope and possibility in in something that is so different than our reality? Like, how can we feel like, oh gosh, I could live with without clutter or with less clutter when all we see is clutter around us? How can we kind of start to believe? Well, I think it's, to your point, noticing that it's really important. Mm. Noticing that your environment is affecting you. Marshall Goldsmith says, if you do not create and control your environment, your environment creates and controls you. Ooh, and good. studies show this over and over and over again, and especially in women. And I think that's just because we're so connective. Everything is fluid for us and everything is connected and it affects us so much. Um, and so realizing that and letting that be a driver for you, like that driving force of like, okay, I see that this is important enough for me to actually do it. And then what do you do it? Like everyone is on the same page here. If something is important to you, it, it takes up space in your calendar. It gets your time. So if it's important to you, put it on the calendar, make time. For me at this point in my life, when I figured this out and I was blogging about it and, and sharing it, I had set aside an hour on Saturday mornings and two hours on Monday mornings for the kids are going to be in front of Netflix and I was just going to purge, you know, they could come and help me if I needed them to or whatever it took. I was going to set, that time was set aside for me to really shift my environment because I had realized what an impact it had on me. Yeah. So put it on the calendar, treat it like it matters. Yeah, I love that. And it, it one, it's one of those things that we want, but you're right. We don't prioritize, we don't make time for, we don't take it into action. Okay, let's talk about how we do this. Because I will tell you, I have noticed a trend. I have three kids, Allie, six, four, and one. And my two boys, but especially my oldest son, he's a hoarder. Like maybe not like the show hoarders, but like that child, he wants to keep everything. How do mm -hmm. we get rid of some of our kids' crap and not get caught? Because you know they're gonna bring it right back in their bedroom if they catch us doing it. And how do we discern what are those things? Like, oh man, that's their favorite thing. Let's keep that. Like, how, like walk me through that because I literally am in the trenches of trying to figure this out because my son wants to keep so much crap. 
Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. So there's a lot of layers to this question, but I'm going to give you guys a few to get started. So first of all, understanding your kid and the way that they are. Um, I have a program called Uncluttered Kids that I created with Amy Turpak, who's a uh, child play therapist. And so she really helped. We, we kind of worked on this together for like a year. And it was like um, the psychology of things yeah. and your kids. And she developed these five different types of motivations and personalities as it relates to basically change in the home environment, which yeah. is super cool. So there's actually, I can give you a link for your show notes. There's a free quiz yeah. you can take to go and figure out which one their kid is and then kind of help them like communicate with them. But understanding your child and how they in particular are relating to things. Okay. Um, I also have a child that, so your son is the emotional and attached type. Okay. So my daughter is also that way. And she's very decluttered and, and lives this way, but she definitely has more than the other kids. And that's fine. Like, it's not about rules and making it this like crazy thing that you have to, because it's too much cleaning, like and you're controlling them and freaking them out and making it kind of feel like a punishment for no reason, you know? Right. It's, it can, it can flow. It can, it get, it has to work for everyone. It has to work for your family. It has to work for who you are and who your kids are. Um, and the other thing is, I don't think that mothers need another thing to micromanage. So I'm all about empowering your kids I to love live this that. way by bringing it into your family culture, not, you know, barking at them and having to nag them and maintain their spaces, like teach them to maintain their own spaces. So in the book, even there's a section on this. That I think it's the biggest chapter of the entire book. And there's lots and lots of tips for specifically what to do with that though. But that's the perspective shift I want the listeners to have is it's not about barking at them and controlling them. It's about bringing this into your family culture. We do this with food very yeah. naturally. Everyone has their own family culture around food and how they eat. A vegan family is going to react when mom puts a pot roast on the table versus another family that eats meat all the time is going to think that this is normal because that's your family culture around food. We also have a family culture around things that's just been unspoken this whole time. So that's good news because you can very easily shift that um, in passive ways without like nagging and yes. controlling the kids and freaking them out. I love that because no one wants to nag and no one wants to micromanage. And let's be honest, moms don't need one more thing to do. So I love, I love that message of freedom. It makes me wonder though, what about when you and your family disagree and maybe even you and your spouse disagree on what things you keep and what things you let go of and or what amount of things you're comfortable with that, that, or they're comfortable with. And I think that that's a big issue in relationships, regardless of your personality style or your level of clean. You typically see one person that is more wanting to declutter and purge and so on and someone else that likes to hold on to things. So how do you how do you come together? Because you obviously, it's, it's both of your homes. You know, it's both, both of you are, are shaping that culture. And so how do you help people find common ground and agreement there? Okay, so first be aware of which one you are. Are you the one that typically gets their way and is kind of like assertive? Or are you the one that typically suppresses what you need and doesn't speak your truth in your relationship and just kind of be aware of what you may need to push against in yourself to come to like a healthy agreement. The second thing is we can't expect everyone in our life and everyone in our house to get on the same page at the same time as us. So just because, you know, you're reading the book, you're listening to this episode, you watch a documentary and you're all amped up about this and you are like, okay, this is important. We're doing this now. You can't expect everyone in your home to be right there at the same time as you. Like that's, you would be upset if they tried to do that to you. Yeah. So giving them their own space, there is so much for you to focus on. It's just yours. Mm. There's so much. Your wardrobe alone is such a journey <laughs> and so <laughs> emotional. Like it's, it, there's a lot to focus on and you don't need them to be on the same page as you. Yeah. And then like, Speak what you need to speak. If this is affecting you, are you the primary one that's doing a lot of the house stuff? Is it pretty evenly split? Like, is it the other person in your house that's doing a lot of the caretaking of the home? Like, get real with what the situation is and just say what you need to say and be honest and have your boundaries while also respecting theirs. I'll yeah. give you an example. When I first started figuring this out, um, I didn't know it was called minimalism or even really simplicity. I just was like, hey, look, less stuff equals me not being so crazy and chaotic. I'm... <laughs> really here for this. And I want to, I, I was like very passionate and I felt so happy that I was feeling better. My depression lifted and did, didn't come back. Like I felt like I had myself again. So when my husband pushed back and was like, 
that's really great, but you're not going to touch my stuff, right? Like, I felt so hurt that he wouldn't want me to be happy or didn't understand me or didn't love me. And like, how could you even say that with what I've been through? And it wasn't that at all. His own childhood had led to him, like, kind of hoarding as well. Mm -hmm. Like, random little screws and knickknacks in in the garage, like, for (laughs) One day, like, for what? I don't know um, anything so, about that, Allie. I can't relate at all. We have no random screws in our garage, I swear. <laughs> stuff like it's that. It's so like, true. And we all have done it at some point. But we he would do it, like, all the time. And, and it was, like, pretty in, pretty intense. And I think just my simplicity shone a light on how bad it was. But he didn't want me, like, purging his stuff while he was at work. And, sure. of course, like, that would make anyone anxious. So we agreed that he would have our bedroom closet and the garage as his spaces. I would not clean them. Cool. I didn't need them to be clean. Okay. But the main living area is, like, I've got to do what i got to do. Sure. So we struck that <laughs> agreement. And we lived that way for two years before, you know, his stuff actually cost us a lot of money and time and a move, and he came around. Yeah. So just let them be on their own journey while also speaking your truth. I love how you're talking about this because I've noticed that for me, Allie, I tend to feel like the state of my house. So if my house is a wreck, I feel like a wreck. If my house is crazy, I feel crazy. So I love that you're helping people fix the physical, which such has an effect on our emotional, just like you described Mm -hmm. with the depression and so on. What about um, kind of circling back to when you were talking about the family culture, and I know you talked about how to how to find agreement even in different time frames, which I think is so wise. In everything you're teaching it has such respect for the other person. And I love that. And such honor for the other person in the process of of coming together. What about um, when you are trying to create this family culture and you're trying to to lead your family patiently in a respectful way towards, you know, just less, less stuff to clean, less stuff to organize, less shuffling stuff, whatever. Um, What about when your kids or even your spouse or whatever they don't, what if they just don't help? And the reason I'm asking this, my husband actually is incredibly supportive. He's such a team player and he does so much. My kids don't so much, no matter how much I try to teach them. Granted, the oldest is six, so we're working on it. But I get this question a lot from women that I coach in business, but also in in life. It's like, my kids just don't help or my spouse just doesn't help or they halfway help. They're like, you know, I got a call recently where, um, the the woman said my you know my my kids would vacuum the floor when I asked them to and then they just left the vacuum in the middle of the floor or they halfway did things and then you're kind of going well I still have to do that so how do you help people delegate honor respect those people but also go guys come on like I need you to really really help for those people that maybe um, maybe the family doesn't help as much. Yeah, I think there's different ways you can go about it. And, you know, everyone, different strokes for different folks. Like, people have different parenting styles and all that. But for me, it's into two categories for me. The first one is kind of more like what you were saying. Like, this is really not acceptable. Like, it's it's not hard. Like, when this is done, this has to be put away. And if it's not going to be done, then we have to, like, have a consequence. Mm-hmm. So let's agree together on what that could be. Um, we actually have a chart on the fridge that's super basic. It's just, like, a piece of paper that we drew on. And it just has at the top, like, how much money the older three kids have and how much game time my youngest has, like, video game time. And then we'll minus it for for like just basic consequences like that. Like everyone agreed there's just got to be a natural consequence. That's how the world works. And then everyone agreed on what the consequence was. So then when it happens, it's almost kind of like, oh man, you you left the vacuum out. It's not me like, I told you. Right. The second second thing is, and I kind of err on this side actually, which took a lot of inner work to get here. But um, I kind of am like, my my kids just vacuumed the house without being told and yeah. that's a win. Yeah. I'll put the vacuum away. Like, it's just, who cares? Right. It's not like now I'm raising these lazy people that right. are like, it's, you know what I mean? Like I, I kind of am more in the energy of like, I mess up a lot of things and I forget things and I leave things out and I'm kind of messy and no one's yelling at me. So I don't need them to be perfect. I don't expect or that's command good. what is not commanded of me. So I kind of am just like, Oh, thank you for vacuuming. Like, just so you know, you left the vacuum out, but I got you. That's good. I love that. Relax. I love it. Not a big deal. Yeah, I love that. It sets you free of the micromanaging. It sets you free of just being so critical. But man, bulldozing your most important relationships to get a clean house is not the best way to go about it. And so I just love your wisdom in 
the 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 method is as important as the outcome and you are just um so full of grace so full of just common sense honoring others on the path to uh, less clutter and more peace, and I love that. Allie, I know people are wondering where they can connect with you, where they can read everything you're up to, learn from you, listen to your podcast, all that, uh, follow you online and so on. So tell people where they can connect with you. Yeah, um, well, I'm so excited the book is finally out because it is a great starting point. It is literally, there's a whole framework of lifestyle coaching that I've built over the years for women. And the book is step one, like the the physical environment is step one. So go get to clutter like a mother. And then I would send you guys to Instagram. That's where I show up every day. There's like really like bite-sized life hacks and tips and kind of behind the scenes and we can connect and you can like, DM me and that's just the best place to spend time. I love Instagram. I love it. Same, same. That's my that's my go-to. Well, Allie, you are such a light, and I know you're giving hope to so many people, and um, and your your advice is so practical, which is so helpful, especially for busy moms. It's like, show me what to do, and I'll do it. And um, I love how practical it is, but it's also so full of hope. So thanks for thanks for being with us. Thanks for being a light in our space and uh, sharing your time with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, y'all, listen. I know it is so easy to feel overcommitted and overwhelmed. I have been there many times. In fact, that is exactly why I wrote my new book, Take Back Your Time, The Guilt-Free Guide to Life Balance. Because you know what? I don't believe life balance is just something you do. I believe it's something you create where you can have balance even in your busy life. In this book, I give you five practical, tactical steps that you can take to create your version of balance so you can shake the guilt and actually enjoy your life right now. Go to christywright.com and go ahead and get your copy of Take Back Your Time, The Guilt-Free Guide to Life Balance today. All right, y'all, I'm so excited because this is the part of the show where I get to take your calls. I love hearing from you. I love hearing your stories and I love getting to talk to you. So we're gonna kick off today with Ada in Huntsville, Alabama. Hey, Ada, how are you? I'm great, Christy. How are you? Great. What's going on? Well, I am just, I've been reading through your book and it is so, so good. And I'm just struggling with setting work goals through the lens of also being a wife and a mom of four. Okay. So let's talk about it. When you say work goals, what do you do and what what specific type of goals are you working on there? Well, I'm in real estate and building as we go. Um, It's been a phenomenal two years for me. We also homeschool our four girls that are 13 down to six. And my husband's in the military. So it's a full plate all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it. (laughs) So, okay. How long have you been in real estate? Two and a half years. All right. What has that looked like? And you can give me the the tactical side of this or even the emotional side of this. What has that looked like for the last two and a half years up to this point? Because that's pretty crazy. You've been doing it this long already. Right. It has been a roller coaster. You know, we all adjusted because I've been a stay-at-home mom for 12 years at that point. Um, but I have amazing support that comes in and helps with the girls on days that I'm actively working. But it's a job that I'm kind of on call. You know, yeah. um, when a house comes on the market, it's got to be shown. So it's been a roller coaster. It's been a phenomenal blessing to our family, financially, of course, but it's definitely taken its own toll. Um, And I'm, I love what I do. I'm at a place of really being selective of, hey, this is my process. If you're willing to work within this process, let's do it. Um, But I'm okay with turning business away. Yeah. So when you say um, childcare, Talk, you know, shoot me straight here. What kind of child care? Do you have a nanny? Do you have babysitters? Do you have family? Who's who's helping the kids and who's homeschooling them with them when you're doing I all this? Have, well, we're getting up at 6 a.m. and knocking school out. Um, my parents are here and super supportive. And then a very good friend of mine who also homeschooled her kids all the way through is helping two days a week. Okay. So it's just kind of piecemealing it together. Everybody's jumping in there. Absolutely. Okay. So take me back to your original question. How do you set goals in your work? Yes. And through the lens of I'm driven and I absolutely love working more than I ever thought that I would. Mm, I love that. So there's this, there's this, but it's fighting the feeling of selfishness and Hey, mama wants to go do all of this. And yet I have five summers left with my oldest. Um, 
and I have a super supportive husband as long as he's in town. Um, but just figuring out where it's pushing too far. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm hiring out housekeeping. I'm hiring, you know, picking up groceries that I've ordered. You know, the little things where I can cut is huge. Yeah. Um, but just what that looks like. Okay. So I don't know if you've gotten to this part of the book yet, but one of the things I talk about in the book, and I talk about it just in life in general, is seasons. And so not just season in the context of your kids are little and you have, you know, however many summers left and that type of thing, but even the seasons of the year. So real estate for the most part, can be pretty seasonal, right? Like I'm assuming your springs and summers are busy and it slows down a little bit in the winter. Is that true? It used to. It no longer does. I was busier October through January this last year than I have ever been. Wow. Okay. All right. So back to your original question, how do you set goals? I think the the biggest thing that you have to do, which is something that only you can do, Ada, I can't do this for you. This is something you have to do. But the good news is you don't do it alone. You're going to do this with your spouse. I think you need to define success. And so the challenge with kids is it's never enough time. I mean, they're always there. They're always being cute. They're always doing something new and amazing. And if you step away to show a house or, you know, do something, you could miss something, a moment, a summer, whatever. And so what I would encourage you to do is define success in these different categories of your life. So define success with your kids. And as tactical as that sounds, say, what amount of hours and even which specific hours do I feel good that if I spend this amount of hours and these hours with my kids... That is winning. So I'm just going to make something up for you. I'm not saying this is right, but this is an example. I feel good if I have the evenings 530 to 730, for example. Or I feel good if I get in 20 hours a week with them. 20 hours a week is a lot. But what you're going to do is you're going to put a time frame on it, not to put your kids in a box and micromanage them, but for your own peace of mind to say, this is success. And then I'm going to shape my schedule around this. And then the hours outside of these 20 hours or the five to seven or whatever you determine success is that you spend in real estate is now guilt-free because you've defined success with your kids. I would do the same thing in real estate. What Say, what is success? Success is X amount of hours. And then when you spend those hours on real estate, you're not feeling guilty and like you're a victim and you're just reacting to the demands and you're instead st- you're setting out intentionally to say, hey, no, I'm going to do this amount of hours here, this amount of hours here, and I'm going to make them work as much as you can within the constraints of um, your kid's schedule, your school schedule, your husband's schedule, and the real estate demand. Now, this may mean that you need to rethink your help. Because it may mean, hey, you know what would be a better use of my time? If I showed houses from 9 to 3, Monday through Friday, and I got someone else to come in and homeschool or some, you know, a nanny, child care teacher, someone in home, some, you know, however you piece that together, and then your time is spent showing houses. I don't know what it looks like for you, but I think it comes down to defining success because what we often do is we say, well, I'll do that when there's time left over and there's never time left over. And we feel we always have this narrative that we're coming from behind. We're never doing enough, never doing enough in real estate, never doing enough with our kids, never doing enough. But the the one thing I want to encourage you is, Ada, before you had your kids, you had desires and strengths and gifts and you still have those. Those are part of what make you, you. It's not anything to feel guilty about. It's not anything you should be ashamed of. It is okay. The way that I say it often is you can love your kids more than life and still want more for your life. You're not a bad woman or person for wanting to use your gifts in this way and wanting to provide for your family, even if you didn't even need the money that you just do it because it gives you joy and you're helping people and making a difference. And so so I think one of the things that could help you is to define success. Define success in your work. Define success with your kids. And of course, this needs to work from a practical standpoint around when your husband's home or not, what childcare you have come in or not. And so it's going to need to reflect those very real restraints and some some things may need to change. Maybe the hours that you show houses change. Maybe the hours you work on homeschool change. Maybe who does homeschool or, or what that looks like changes. But I just want to encourage you, you don't have to feel guilty for wanting to do more. And in the same light, if someone's listening right now or watching, you don't have to feel guilty if you don't want to do more. 
the the thing that I posted on Instagram today is what matters most is that you do what matters most to you. And everyone's different. Everyone's called to different types of work, different types of family, different stages and seasons of life. And I just want to help you figure that out for yourself. So I just encourage you, Ada, to define success. What amount of hours each week do you feel good working on real estate? What amount of hours do you feel good working with your kids? And then know that you can rest in the fact that you did what was right for you. It's a great question. I hope this encourages you. And the other thing is I would just give yourself grace as your season changes. Let's say you have a great plan and then your husband is deployed and that plan needs to change. Or you had help and then the help gets sick and can't come and that plan needs to change. You have permission to change your mind, your plans, in your priorities. In fact, you should. Thanks for calling, Ada. I hope that helps you. All right, y'all. I love hanging out with you guys. As always, you can tune in next week for another new episode of The Christy Wright Show. And for more encouragement on becoming the person you want to be, you can visit christywright.com.